Good evening, I'm Errol Lewis, and you are watching State of the Union coverage on Spectrum News. It's 8.55 p.m. on Capitol Hill, where President Joe Biden is about to deliver the annual address to a joint session of Congress. This could potentially be his final State of the Union address. It comes during an election year. This could also be the president's biggest audience between now and November. Alabama Senator Katie Britt will be delivering the Republican response after the president speaks. President Biden, of course, drawing a big crowd for this address, not just inside the chamber, but also outside. <laughs> Those are live pictures from Washington, D.C. People are protesting the president's support for Israel's war against Hamas. It is something that President Biden has seen during his campaign events recently. So now let's head inside uh, the chamber of the House of Representatives, where lawmakers have waited hours to get an aisle seat. Uh, they want a chance to shake the president's hand as he walks to the podium and deliver his speech. Uh, there are a number of dignitaries already in the chamber, and others are processing in. Uh, many of the members who s spend hours there uh, want to get a little camera time, want to show the folks back home that uh, they are uh, known to the president and uh, perhaps uh, getting a chance to whisper in his ear and request something. A lot of pageantry tonight. The members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff are here, members of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, you see a number of members of Congress wearing suffragette white, many of the women uh, making a statement there. Uh, we've got here on set with me Spectrum News anchor and chief national political reporter Josh Robin, Spectrum News political anchors Jason Fechner and Karina Kling and Alex Cohen and Tim Boyum are also joining us tonight. And we're going to start with our national political reporter Taylor Popolars, who is live on Capitol Hill. And Taylor, uh, we got some excerpts of the president's address. What do we know he is planning to touch on tonight? Yes, Errol, some brief excerpts from the White House touching on three different topics. The first is what's been a hot-button issue, the topic of abortion rights and reproductive freedom for women after Roe versus Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court. In the brief excerpt that the president released talking about how if Congress could help him, he would try to restore Roe versus Wade. The second ex excerpt talked about communities across America making what Biden calls the greatest comeback story ever told, thanks to economic aid from his administration and kind of the course correct coming out of the pandemic. And then the third expert excerpt, what stood out most to me, I want to put up on screen. This is a section where Biden said, quote, my lifetime has taught me to embrace freedom and democracy, a future based on the core values that have defined America, honesty, decency, dignity, equality, to respect everyone, to give everyone a fair shot, to give hate no safe harbor. Now, some other people my age see a different story, an American story of resentment, revenge and retribution. That's not me. I think it goes without saying that he's likely alluding to his general election opponent, former President Donald Trump, who is just three and a half years younger than him. And now, after the Super Tuesday we saw earlier this week, the presumptive Republican nominee, as you alluded to, this State of the Union not only comes toward the end of President Biden's first term, but as we ramp up into this general election, as he's vying for a second term, he will be having to kind of show that he's still up for a second term. Being 81 years old, he'll have to acknowledge those demonstrators that we just saw outside the Capitol and outside the White House. He also needs to lay out not only his accomplishments of the last three years in change, but his goals for the next potential four plus years in office. So it's going to be interesting to hear what else he touches on. OK, thanks very much for that, Taylor. We've got members of the Supreme Court who uh, 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 processed in. It looked like a solid uh, majority, at least six members I saw there. Tim Boyum, you were at the White House earlier today. What did they tell you about what we should expect to hear from the president a few minutes from now? Yeah, I'm, I'm drowning in talking points, Errol, uh, all day long. Uh, uh, we heard from cabinet officials. We heard from all kinds of folks. And one thing that we heard over and over and over is that they believe the president has accomplished more in three years than presidents have done in two terms. And they're going to lay those things out over and over. We're definitely going to hear about things also, though, about abortion, IVF. That was on the agenda today quite a bit. Gun violence. Uh, we heard those uh, things from individuals today. And, but there, what I'm interested to hear about, and something I asked about a lot today, was that they laid out all kinds of things, programs, money that's gone out in communities all across the country to change life. 
But there's still a feeling in America with a lot of people, for instance, on the economy, that they still don't feel great about that. And, and we ask that over and over today. And I think it's going to be uh, very important for the president to not only explain what they've done, but how they can make Americans feel better about the economy, the grocery prices and whatnot. And how they do that will have a lot to do with how they do in November, I think. Okay. And now, Josh, the president is expected to announce plans for a temporary port on Gaza's coast to help provide humanitarian aid. You were keeping a close eye on the uncommitted protest votes during uh, the Super Tuesday contest. Uh, does this news uh, sort of um, reflect the White House's concerns about uh, voters and how they may react or respond to the situation in the Middle East? I think definitely those voters have made their point known. The president initially was telling Israel that they have to keep a closer eye on the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip. But I think that the fact that one in five voters in Minnesota on Tuesday night voted uncommitted, uh, we think at least in a majority way to protest what's happening in Gaza certainly reflects that. And the news, according to senior administration officials, is that there's going to be this temporary port uh, on the Gaza Strip that's going to be open. No American boots on the ground, but it will allow more aid to come in. We've seen already Americans uh, drop uh, rations from the air, joining European partners to do that. They've also pressed Israel, and this is new today, to open another crossing. This apparently is the Eras crossing, which is in the northern part of the Gaza Strip. And additionally, there are the hopes that the Biden administration has to bring about a ceasefire there. Right now, the Biden administration is blaming Hamas for a lack of a ceasefire. Israel has apparently put a lot on the table. Um, that's something that the Biden administration is having difficulty convincing elements of his party about. As you saw with those protests there, there's a lot of blame against Israel, but there's none against Hamas, who launched this deadly invasion on the 7th of October. Okay, thank you for that uh, update. Uh, we have a number of members of, uh, of uh, senior officials in government. You see some members there, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, along with Justice Sotomayor, uh, chatting a number of different um, officials there in the room. We believe, uh, we've been told, I should say, that President Biden is, in fact, in the building, so he'll be making his way, and we will uh, bring that to you, the uh, ceremonial entrance of the president who is in the People's House at the invitation uh, of the uh, leadership of Congress. He doesn't get to just walk in because he feels like it. Uh, he is a guest uh, tonight. And we'll again, we'll bring that uh, to you in uh, just a couple of minutes when that is expected to happen. And now, Alex Cohen, people who uh, personify the president's messaging will be front and center. Uh, this is a tradition I believe President Reagan began. They'll be in the First Lady's viewing box. And it includes Alabama's uh, Supreme Court's controversial ruling about embryos on the agenda. It forced Republican lawmakers there to fast track legislation to protect in vitro fertilization clinics. And we've got someone who was affected by that who's going to be in the, the first lady's box. Clearly they are trying to signal that this is an issue that they want to talk about uh, both tonight and perhaps beyond on the campaign trail. And it makes sense, Errol. I mean, we don't have to look much past the year 2022 when reproductive rights played such a crucial role in the election. And despite widespread talk of a, a red wave, that did not happen. And a lot of folks say that was in no small part because of people turning up at the ballot box really moved by that particular issue. Uh, the President Biden has also indicated that he would like to reinstate Roe versus Wade. As you mentioned earlier, Errol, a number of the women there in the audience tonight wearing white, uh, the suffragette color. This was a tradition that started under Donald Trump. And I think that they will be capitalizing on what we've seen become such a pivotal and controversial issue in recent days and highlighting it tonight. It's a very strategic move. OK, let me go back to uh, Taylor Popolars for just a minute. Uh, Senator Katie Britt from uh, Alabama. Where is she on this whole in vitro fertilization uh, issue, that uh, controversial decision out of Alabama? And what is her uh, presence on the agenda uh, giving the Republican response intended to signal? 
Well, to, first off, what Republicans wanted to draw a sharp contrast to is President Joe Biden's age. He's the oldest ever president at 81 years old right now, wants to serve another four-year term. Katie Britt, who's this Republic, freshman Republican senator from Alabama, is currently 42 years old and is currently the youngest Republican woman ever elected to the Senate. So that's the immediate contrast they want to draw. In terms of the, the IVF story that came out of Alabama, what was interesting is you had most of Alabama's lawmakers, both at the federal and state level, disagree with what their state Supreme Court ended up ruling. We know just last night the governor of Alabama, who is a very conservative Republican, signed legislation that was fast-tracked through the state legislature to restore those protections because there was so much outcry from this. So Katie Britt is a, is a mother. She's one of the few mothers in the Senate who has younger kids. It'll be interesting to see kind of how she talks about this broader topic as both a conservative Republican but as also a, a young mother of children. So I think Republicans are are hoping that she not only represents the future of their party, but can draw a sharp contrast to President Joe Biden, both in age and the fact that the Democratic Party right now is being led by an elderly white man. And here is this young woman on the Republican side of the aisle who can kind of chart out the, the course for the future. Yeah, that's right. And um, uh, Karina Kling, the, uh, the president is uh, also, I mean, I guess really sort of doubling down on this issue of reproductive rights. Katie Cox will be joining the First Lady tonight. She was forced to leave the state of Texas because of its strict abortion law ever since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. Uh, this is uh, apparently an issue that Democrats are going to be talking about at a minimum and probably running on in the fall. Yeah, Biden and other Democrats have really seized on her story as an example of the unintended consequences or perhaps the unintended consequences or just the consequences of some of what states have enacted following the fall of Roe v. Wade. And Kate Cox is a, an example of that. She sued Texas, as you mentioned, uh, trying to get an abortion for a fetal, fatal diagnosis that she got, which her doctor said not only uh, hindered her health, but the baby's health. And potential future reproductive uh, issues for her. And so she was denied that and ended up leaving the state to get an abortion. But the Bidens have invited her there. So just another key example of the issue being front and center. And this will be front and center as it heads into the general election. Democrats really harping on this. Um, but also Texas members of Congress um, inviting some of the women who have sued the state over the state's law, which bans all abortions except at the, if the mother's life is in danger, and doctors have just said that that language is so vague, and that's the case of Cox, uh, to use it as, as an example, and just said our hands are tied because of the civil and criminal liabilities that we could face. Uh, they want to clear up this language, and that is currently still before uh, our state Supreme Court. And so a lot of people watching to see how the, I will say, the Republican-led Supreme Court here in our state might rule on that. Okay, now um, let's go to uh, Jason Fechner, uh, the president of the United Auto Workers. Sean Fain is attending this uh, address as a guest of the president and the first lady. Uh, there'll be some other union members as well. A reminder, of course, that President Biden took the unprecedented step of joining that union's picket line back in September. Uh, obviously, the union vote very important to this president, not only uh, in his government role, but as a candidate for office. And to that end, the AFL-CIO had posted to X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, earlier today that this president is indeed the first one to walk a picket line. They were kind of promoting the State of the Union address tonight. And you've got some big-time battleground states here in the Midwest, especially where union membership factors into Democratic support, especially ahead of November. About 8 percent union membership here in Wisconsin, around 12 to 13 percent in places like Michigan and Pennsylvania, states that President Biden likely needs to win again to win re-election there. So it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out this evening, what he talks about when it comes to unions, because, again, the Teamsters Union right now, they made a donation to the RNC, the first time donating to Republicans in quite some time. They have not yet endorsed President Biden or former President Trump. Biden set to meet with them later this month. So clearly he is looking to court union support, both through the State of the Union address this evening and the rest of the presidential race as well. Okay, Doug Emhoff, the uh, second gentleman there on the screen, has entered the, uh, the, the, the uh, box uh, up in the gallery where the vice president's family and guests will be. Um, Jason, uh, the, the so-called blue wall, Wisconsin, Mich Michigan, Pennsylvania, 
where Democrats uh, traditionally do well and need to do well, certainly that was part of the strategy four years ago for Joe Biden. What, uh, beyond these uh, union issues, do you think those states are hoping to hear from the president tonight? Well, we have seen, obviously, that issue play out in places like Minnesota and Michigan, especially with fears about the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas and how that has factored into these uh, undecided voters out there or uncommitted voters across parts of the Midwest. So that's important to, to watch play out. Of course, back in 2020, President Biden flipped five essential states to help him win the White House. Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. If he were to lose Arizona and Georgia, rather, he could still win re-election if he holds on to that Midwestern blue wall. But he has got to really drive home points about the economy to Midwesterners right now. That union support is critical. And then the rest of the issues that are critical to a lot of Americans out there going forward through the rest of the general election process. He's really got to lock down those three states. And to that end, both Biden, Vice President Kamala Harris, their surrogates, basically in a state like Wisconsin almost every week going forward. Okay. Stand by, Jason. The President's Cabinet. Members of the president's cabinet now making their way in. Uh, and of course, uh, the little game is to try and figure out which member of the cabinet is not there. That person is the designated survivor. Uh, there's Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State. I see Secretary Lloyd Austin behind him. Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, not the designated survivor. She's here tonight. Uh, Josh, obviously, what the president says tonight is important. The issues he speaks about are what we're going to talk about. The White House, of course, fully aware that many voters have concerns about the president's age, meaning um, how he delivers the speech will also be uh, important as well tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, preparing for the speech at Camp David, uh, one thinks, uh, if you're a fan of the president, one hopes he got some R&R &R as well. Look, there's nothing he can do to reverse the, the, uh, the march of time, but what he can do is deliver a speech that is energetic, uh, where he looks like he's in control, where he's having fun, where there aren't too many gaffes. The way people watch uh, President Biden now, a lot of them are just on pins and needles worrying that something might happen to him. Um, and, you know, he has... I think he delivered a, a very convincing speech last time around. He engaged with the audience, um, many of whom are not friendly to him. And we can anticipate that the same will happen uh, tonight. And I think that what he'll say is a version of he'll, he'll probably, if past his prologue, he'll, he'll make some sort of crack about himself, um, but then talk about how his ideas are young, his ideas are the future, whereas he might not mention Donald Trump by name. I doubt he will. But he'll say that the ideas represented by his opponent are those of the past. Right. We don't know how directly he's going to um, uh, address his predecessor. But, Taylor, uh, as we mentioned, the official Republican response will be delivered by Senator Katie Britt of Alabama. But it turns out that former President Donald Trump will also be uh, making a speech or a statement, some kind of response to tonight's address. Uh, uh, what's that all about? <laughs> it, it goes to show the social media age that we're living in. The former president is currently doing what he's calling a live play-by-play -play reaction on his social media app, Truth Social. To give you an idea, I was just checking. There's at least three different equivalents of tweets from the former president, one of them saying that he felt Biden was leaving the White House, quote, substantially late, and that his Secret Service would have to drive, quote, very, very quickly. You just don't want to be late to the State of the Union. They will need Mario Andretti to be at the wheel of the limo. Trump is also giving play-by-play -play of some of the members of Congress he's seeing on the floor as he's watching what we're watching playing out. So just goes to show kind of the, the, the unique age that we're living in. I also want to point out that independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr., he just released his own version of a State of the Union address, a nine-minute video that he posted on X, the platform formerly known as Twitter. So because of, of this digital era, all the major presidential candidates are able to weigh in on this night, which normally and historically used to be just the giant bully pulpit for the current occupier of the White House. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's actually helpful. It's not a serious response. Mario Andretti, by the way, for those who don't know, which I assume is a lot of our viewers, 
uh, is, is a, was a top race car driver in like the 1970s. It is a very dated reference, <laughs> a very, very dated reference indeed. Uh, for those uh, uh, playing along at home, uh, trivia buffs, Miguel Cardona, the education secretary, is the designated survivor. Uh, and that is uh, by tradition, that's for purposes of continuity of government. Uh, if something should happen to all of these important people in this room, uh, there is an order of succession. The designated survivor would become the uh, president of the United States. Now, uh, Karina Kling, uh, the other issue that I know you all have covered uh, out of Spectrum News there in Texas involves the border, uh, border security, a major, major issue, according to the polls and on the campaign trail. And uh, I imagine we're going to hear something about that tonight. What do you think? I do. I think the, the president will address something with, when it comes to border security, immigration. Uh, he knows that this is a problem for him heading into the general election and needs to get out in front of it. I don't know that he will take any executive action or any steps because I think part of that is that Republicans will then just blame him and say, why didn't you do this? weeks ago, months ago, years ago, um, and they blame him for the border crisis that uh, we're currently seeing. And so I think he may use it as just another push to try to get Congress to pass this bipartisan border security deal that was basically tanked when former President Trump weighed in and said, don't pass this, let's use this as a campaign issue heading into November. And so the politics are really at play uh, nothing new there when it comes to all of this. I don't know, again, that he'll announce any actions uh, that he will take unilaterally to try and do stuff on the border, but definitely address it and, and try to figure out a way to work his messaging on this, uh, as it is just a week since both he and Trump were on the Texas-Mexico border uh, delivering very differing messages. Yeah, and certainly another uh, Texas issue I know you all spent a lot of time covering I believe the president has as one of his guests uh, survivors of the massacre in Uvalde uh, no, no, to talk no. about uh, or to put a spotlight Mr. on Speaker, gun control. Let's the listen president in. President of the United States. So, uh, Tim, as the president makes his way to uh, the dais to begin the speech, uh, at the White House, the, did they talk about the kind of legislative agenda he might lay out today? That is a part of these speeches, asking Congress in the current session to do certain things. Yeah, you know, they, they talked about a lot of what they've wanted to get through, and they have not in some instances. But, yeah, I mean, 
We talked with um, some of their economic advisors uh, about the proposal that we've heard about corporate tax increases today. And, uh, you know, they, they keep pushing that, you know, there needs to be a fair share from these billionaires and whatnot. There was a large discussion about that, about creating a, a fairer economy. And so that, that was a big part of that. One of the things I want to notice, too, and, and I talked to the White House Press Secretary 101 today, and I asked her about the age and naming Donald Trump by name. And they're going to push that his experience is why they've gotten through what they've gotten through in Congress, and that that is making all the difference. And so I think they're going to try to pay attention to see if he flips it and tries to make that a positive for him. And then also, when I asked her about naming Donald Trump by name, um, she said she obviously wouldn't tell me whether he's going to or not. But she immediately turned it and started talking about the, the insurrection and the former president. And so I think we're going to hear a, a few moments of that tonight, too, uh, throughout this, even if we don't hear Donald Trump by name. Uh, Tim, did they, was there any mention of uh, the, the protesters who, it turns out, uh, blocked the motorcade, at least briefly, resulting in it, what we believe is at least one arrest? Is that anywhere on their radar as a, as a topic of active concern? There, there wasn't, and, and to, to be honest with you, we were off campus um, by about 4.30 or 5 this afternoon. Uh, we did see protesters out in front of the White House early this morning, but by the time we left, there was a, a significantly larger uh, police presence outside the White House, and they were gone. Obviously, they probably moved down to the uh, Capitol area. Um, but so it was not a huge discussion point today, although there were several questions about Gaza and the Israel-Hamas war. Um, and, and there was some agitation. There was a reporter from Michigan there that kept asking questions over and over. And there was a little bit of agitation as he kept asking questions about that. And they wanted to talk about other things as well. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how he addresses that tonight because it's, it's clearly a sore spot. Sure. Um, the president uh, slowly, slowly making his way uh, to the podium. Uh, in past years, you would grab his, uh, the president's hand and whisper in his ear. Uh, in these days of selfies, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand there, uh, in this, these days of selfies, people want to take a little picture. He's stopping, of course, for a picture. Uh, important to keep in mind that most of the legislators in that chamber are currently running for re-election. Uh, so there's a lot of political business being done in many respects. It more closely resembles a political convention uh, than uh, a, a government function. Uh, staying with you for a minute, Tim, when the, the White House lined up its issues, did you get the feeling that the economy was going to be first among equals? What's their, what's their number one selling point that they wanted to get across to you? You know, I, I really think it was um, reproductive rights. It was the very first topic that was brought up uh, when we talked to the White House uh, press secretary, the communications director. It was the first guest that came out in front of us. And it was talking about, you know, Roe v. Wade being struck down, IVF. I asked about IVF, whether, you know, the new law that was signed into law last night was sort of making a moot point. And they said, no way. They think that there's a possibility that other states could move forward with the Alabama State Supreme Court and what they did. And they want federal movement on this as well. And so I, I think that is, was a huge focal point. They do feel proud of what they've done with the economy, um, but I think they do understand that there's this difference between how the economy looks on paper and how people feel about the economy. And that's going to be the greatest challenge, I think, for President Biden over the course of the next eight months is to try to get people to feel better about it. But, you know, when, when, and they did point out that, the, you know, eggs and stuff were, were cheaper than they were at this time last year, but people are still paying so much more than they were a few years ago that I don't know how you make people feel better about that. Yeah, the all-important egg test. Uh, we, we know that uh, inflation, of course, is a, an index of the rate of increase of prices. So even if uh, prices, the rate of increase is coming down, those prices are pretty high. They got jacked up several years ago and have never really come down. They're just not going up uh, quite as quickly, uh, a source of concern for a lot of people. Uh, former Speaker Nancy Pelosi there, along with the uh, members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Nancy Pelosi looked like she's uh, trying to direct a little traffic, maybe push people back and let him get up there so we can get this speech started uh, b b before midnight. <laughs> a lot of uh, attention being focused. Uh, just a minute ago, there were chants of four more years, presumably from the Democrats in the chamber. Uh, not clear what the Republicans have done or are, or are going to do. Uh, but uh, here again, this uh, feels in many ways like 
the political conventions that we like to cover, Tim, of like a, a, a real democratic love fest going on here on the floor. The irony here is, too, because, you know, there's always out in the world, people think Democrats always start late and Republicans are right on time. It's just sort of a joke within political circles. Everything was literally on time, if not earlier today at the White House. Uh, so this is kind of a funny moment here as we wait. It's at 925 almost, uh, waiting for the State of the Union to start. Uh, but, you know, when, when politicians, Errol, you know this, when they start shaking hands and taking selfies, uh, th this could go on for a while. <laughs> You know, he, he needs their help and vice versa. Once again, um, all 435, I think, uh, with a couple of vacancies, members of Congress are up for re-election. Uh, so with or without a primary in front of you, if you're a member of Congress, you've got some political business to do. The president uh, giving a copy of his speech to the Speaker of the House and a copy, of course, to the President of the Senate, also known as the Vice President of the United States. And we're ready to begin. Tony. If I were smart, I'd go home now. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Madam Vice President, members of Congress, my fellow Americans, in January 1941, Franklin Roosevelt came to this chamber to speak to the nation, and he said, I address you at a moment unprecedented in the history of the Union. Hitler was on the march. War was raging in Europe. President Roosevelt's purpose was to wake up Congress and alert the American people that this was no ordinary time. Freedom and democracy were under assault in the world. Tonight, I come to this same chamber to address the nation. Now, it's we who face an unprecedented moment in the history of the Union. And yes, my purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is that freedom and democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas at the very same time. <clears throat> overseas, Putin of Russia is on the march, invading Ukraine and sowing chaos throughout Europe and beyond. If anybody in this room thinks Putin will stop at Ukraine, I assure you he will not. But Ukraine, Ukraine can stop Putin. Ukraine can stop Putin if we stand with Ukraine and provide the weapons that needs to defend itself. That is all. That is all Ukraine is asking. They're not asking for American soldiers. In fact, there are no American soldiers at war in Ukraine, and I'm determined to keep it that way. But now, assistance to Ukraine is being blocked by those who want to walk away from our world leadership. It wasn't long ago when a Republican president named Ronald Reagan thundered, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Now, now my predecessor, 
A former Republican president tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. A former president actually said that, bowing down to a Russian leader, I think it's outrageous, it's dangerous, and it's unacceptable. <laughs> America is a founding member of NATO. The military alliance of democratic nations created after World War II prevent, to prevent war and keep the peace. And today, we've made NATO stronger than ever. We welcomed Finland to the alliance last year. And just this morning, Sweden officially joined, and their minister is here tonight. Come here, stand up. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And they know how to fight. Mr. Prime Minister, welcome to NATO, the strongest military alliance the world has ever seen. I say this to Congress. We have to stand up to Putin. Yeah. Send me a bipartisan national security bill. History is literally watching. History is watching. If the United States walks away, it will put Ukraine at risk. Europe is at risk. The free world will be at risk, emboldening others to do what they wish to do us harm. My message to President Putin, who I've known for a long time, is simple. We will not walk away. We will not bow down. I will not bow down. In a literal sense, history is watching. History is watching. Just like history watched three years ago on January 6th, yeah. when insurrectionists stormed this very capital and placed the dagger to the throat of American democracy. Many of you are here on that darkest of days. We all saw with our own eyes the insurrectionists were not patriots. They'd come to stop the peaceful transfer of power, to overturn the will of the people. January 6th lies about the 2020 election and the plots to steal the election posed a great, gravest threat to U.S. democracy since the Civil War. But they failed. America stood. America stood strong, and democracy prevailed. We must be honest. The threat to democracy must be defended. My predecessor and some of you here seek to bury the truth about January 6th. I will not do that. This is the moment to speak the truth and to bury the lies. Here's the simple truth. You can't love your country only when you win. Ever since being elected to office, I ask all of you, without regard to party, to join together and defend democracy. Yeah. Remember your oath of office is defending against all threats, foreign and domestic. Yeah. Respect. Respect free and fair elections. Restore trust in our institutions. And make clear political violence has absolutely no place, no place in America, zero place. Again, it's not, it's not hyperbole to suggest history is watching. We're watching. Your children and grandchildren will read about this day and what we do. History is watching another assault on freedom. Joining us the light is Latoya Beasley, a social worker from Birmingham, Alabama. Fourteen months ago, 14 months ago, she and her husband welcomed a baby girl thanks to the miracle of IVF. She scheduled treatments to have that second child. But the Alabama Supreme Court shut down IVF treatments across the state. 
unleashed by a Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade. She was told her dream would have to wait, but her family had got through should never have happened. Unless Congress acts, it could happen again. So tonight, let's stand up for families like hers. To my friends across the aisle, don't keep this waiting any longer. <laughs> Guarantee the right to ADF. Guarantee it nationwide. Like most Americans, I believe Roe v. Wade got it right. I thank Vice President Harris for being an incredible leader defending reproductive freedom and so much more. Thank you. My predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturned. He's the reason it was overturned, and he brags about it. Look at the chaos that has resulted. Joining us tonight is Kate Cox, the wife and mother from Dallas. She's become pregnant again and had a fetus of a fatal condition. Her doctor told Kate that her own life and her ability to have children in the future were at risk if she didn't act. Because Texas law banned her ability to act, Kate and her husband had to leave the state to get what she needed. What her family got through should have never happened as well, but it's happening in too many others. There are state laws banning the freedom to choose, criminalizing doctors, forcing survivors of rape and incest to leave their states to get the treatment they need. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. My God, what freedom else would you take away? Look. It's a decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court majority wrote the following. And with all due respect, Justices, women are not without electoral, electoral power. Oh, excuse me, electoral or political power. You're about to realize just how much you get right about. about overturning Roe v. Wade have no clue about the power of women. But they found out when reproductive freedom was on the ballot, we won in 2022 and 2020, and we'll win again in 2024. <laughs> if you, if you, the American people, Send me a Congress that supports the right to choose. I promise you, I'll restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land again. <laughs> Folks, America cannot go back. I'm here to, tonight to show what I believe is the way forward, because I know how far we come. Four years ago next week, before I came to office, the country was hit by the worst pandemic and the worst economic crisis in a century. Remember the fear? Record losses? Remember the spikes in crime and the murder rate? Raging virus that took more than one million American lives of loved ones, millions left behind? A mental health crisis of isolation and loneliness? A president, my predecessor, failed the most basic presidential duty that he owes to American people, the duty to care. I think that's unforgivable. I came to office determined to get us through one of the toughest periods in the nation's history. We have. It doesn't make new, but in a news in a thousand cities and towns, the American people are writing the greatest comeback story never told. <laughs> So let's tell the story here. Tell it here and now. America's comeback is building the future of American possibilities, building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down, investing in all America, in all Americans, to make every sure everyone has a fair shot, and we leave no one, no one behind. 
The pandemic no longer controls our lives. The vaccine that saved us from COVID are now being used to beat cancer, turning setback into comeback. That's what America does. That's what America does. <clears throat> Folks, I inherited economies on the brink. Now our economy is literally the envy of the world. 15 million new jobs in just three years, a record, a record. <laughs> Unemployment at 50-year lows. A record 16 million Americans are starting small businesses, and each one is a literal act of hope. With historic job growth and small business growth for Black and Hispanics and Asian Americans, 800,000 new manufacturing jobs in America and counting. Where is it written we can't be the manufacturing capital of the world? We are, we will. More people have health insurance today. More people have health insurance today than ever before. The racial wealth gap is as small as it's been in 20 years. Wages keep going up, inflation keeps coming down. Inflation has dropped from 9% to 3%, the lowest in the world, and tending lower. The landing is and will be soft. And now, instead of importing, importing foreign products and exporting American jobs, we're exporting American products and creating American jobs. Right here in America, where they belong. And it takes time, but the American people are beginning to feel it. Consumer studies show consumer confidence is soaring. Buy America has been the law of the land since the 1930s. Past administrations, including my pre predecessor, including some Democrats as well in the past, failed to buy American. Not anymore. On my watch, federal projects that you fund, like helping build American roads, bridges, and highways, will be made with American products and built by American workers. <laughs> Creating good-paying American jobs. And thanks to our Chips and Science Act, the United States is investing more in research and development than ever before. During the pandemic, a shortage of semiconductors, chips, that drove up the price of everything from cell phones to automobiles. And by the way, we invented those chips right here in America. Well, instead of having to import them, instead of we, private companies are now investing billions of dollars to build new chip factories here in America, creating tens of thousands of jobs. Many of those jobs paying $100,000 a year and don't require a college degree. <laughs> In fact, my policies have attracted $650 billion in private sector investment in clean energy, advanced manufacturing, creating tens of thousands of jobs here in America. <laughs> and, thanks, and thanks to our bipartisan infrastructure law, 46,000 new projects have been announced all across your communities. And by the way, I noticed some of you have strongly voted against it, or they're cheering on that money coming in. I like it. I'm with you. I'm with you. And if any of you don't want that money in your district, just let me know. <laughs> Modernizing our roads and bridges, ports and airports, public transit systems. Removing po poisonous lead pipes so every child can drink clean water without risk of brain damage. <clears throat> Providing affordable, affordable high-speed internet for every American, no matter where you live, urban, suburban, or rural communities, in red states and blue states. Record investments in tribal communities. Because of my investment in family farms, Because I invested in family farms led by my sector of agriculture and knows more about this than anybody I know. 
were better able to stay in the family for the, those farms for the, and their children and grandchildren won't have to leave, leave home to make a living. It's transformative. The great comeback story is Belvedere, Illinois, home to an auto plant for nearly 60 years. Before I came to office, the plant was on its way to shutting down. Thousands of workers feared for their livelihoods. Hope was fading. Then I was elected to office, and we raised the Belvedere repeatedly with auto companies, knowing unions would make all the difference. The UAW worked like hell to keep the plan open and get these jobs back, and together we succeeded. Instead of auto factories shutting down, auto factories reopening, the new state-of-the-art battery factories being built to power those cars there at the same time. The folks of Belvedere, I say, instead of your town being left behind, your community is moving forward again. Because instead of watching auto job, jobs of the future go overseas, 4,000 union jobs with higher wages are building the future in Belvedere right here in America. Here tonight, is UAW President Sean Fain, a great friend and a great labor leader. Sean, where are you? Stand up. And, and Dawn... And Dawn Sims, a third-generation worker, UAW worker at Belvedere. Sean, I was proud to be the first president to stand on the picket line, and today, Dawn has a good job in her hometown, providing stability for her family and pride and dignity as well. Showing once again, Wall Street didn't build America. They're not bad guys. They didn't build it, though. The middle class built the country, and unions built the middle class. I say to the American people, when America gets knocked down, we get back up. We keep going. That's America. That's you, the American people. It's because of you America's coming back. It's because of you our future is brighter. It's because of you that tonight we can proudly say the state of our union is strong and getting stronger. Tonight, tonight, I want to talk about the future of possibilities that we can build together. A future where the days of trickle-down economics are over and the wealthy and the biggest corporations no longer get the, all the tax breaks. And by the way, I understand corporations. I come from a state that has more corporations invested than every one of your states in the state of the United States combined. And I represented for 36 years. I'm not anti-corporation, but I grew up in a home where trickle-down economics didn't put much on my dad's kitchen table. That's why I determined to turn things around so middle class does well. When they do well, the poor of a way up and the wealthy still do very well. We all do well. And there's more to do to make sure you're feeling the benefits of all we're doing. Americans pay more for prescription drugs than anywhere in the world. It's wrong, and I'm ending it. For the law that I proposed and signed, not one of you Republican buddies worked, voted for it. We finally beat Big Pharma. Instead of paying $400 a month or thereabouts for insulin with diabetes, and it only costs 10 bucks to make, they only get paid 35 a month now and still make healthy profit. And I want to. But what to do next? I want to cap the cost of insulin at $35 a month for every American who needs it. Everyone.
for years. People have talked about it, but finally we got it done and gave Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices on prescription drugs, just like the VA is able to do for veterans. That's not just saving seniors' money. It's saving taxpayers' money. We cut the federal deficit by $160 billion. Because Medicare will no longer have to pay those exorbitant prices to Big Pharma. This year, Medicare is negotiating lower prices for some of the costliest drugs on the market to treat everything from heart disease to arthritis. It's now time to go further and give Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices for 500 different drugs over the next decade. They're making a lot of money, guys. And they'll still be extremely profitable. Will not only save lives, it will save taxpayers another $200 billion. <laughs> Starting next year, the same law caps total prescription drug costs for seniors on Medicare at $2,000 a year. Even for expensive cancer drugs, it costs ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars. Now I want to cap prescription drug costs at $2,000 a year for everyone. <laughs> Folks. I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but if you want to get an Air Force One, and fly to Toronto, Berlin, Moscow, I mean, excuse me, and it, well, even Moscow, probably. <laughs> and bring your prescription with you, and I promise you, I'll get it for you for 40 percent the cost you're paying now. Same company, same drug, same place. Folks, the Affordable Care Act, the old Obamacare, yeah. it's, it's still a very big deal. million of you can no longer be denied health insurance because of pre-existing condition. Well, my predecessor and many in this chamber want to take this prescription drug away by repealing the Affordable Care Act. I'm not going to let that happen. We stopped you 50 times before and we'll stop you again. In fact, I'm not only protecting it, I'm expanding it. The, we, the enacted tax credits of $800 per person per year reduce health care costs for millions of working families. That tax credit expires next year. I want to make that savings permanent. <laughs> to state the obvious, women are more than half our population. But research on women's health has always been underfunded. That's why we're launching the first ever White House initiative on women's health research, led by Jill, doing an incredible job as First Lady. For, pa for past my plan for $12 billion to transfer women's health research, and benefit millions of lives all across America. <clears throat> I know the cost of housing is so important to you. If inflation keeps coming down, mortgage rates will come down as well, and the Fed acknowledges that. But I'm not waiting. I want to provide an annual tax credit that will give Americans $400 a month for the next two years as mortgage rates come down to put toward their mortgages when they buy their first home or trade up for a little more space. Just for two years. And my administration is also eliminating title insurance on federally backed mortgages. When you refinance your home, you can save $1,000 or more as a consequence. For millions of renters, we're cracking down on big landlords who use antitrust law, using antitrust, who break antitrust laws by price fixing and driving up rents. We've cut red tape so builders can get federally financing, which is already helping build 
a record 1.7 million new house, housing units nationwide. <laughs> now pass. Now pass and build and renovate 2 million affordable homes and bring those rents down. To remain the strongest economy in the world, we need to have the best education system in the world. And I, like I suspect all of you, want to give a child, every child, a good start by providing access to preschool for three and four years old. You know, I think I pointed out last year I think I pointed out last year that children coming from broken homes where there's no books, they're not read to, not spoken to very often, start school, kindergarten, or first grade, hearing having heard a million fewer words spoken. Well, studies show that children who go to preschool are nearly 50 percent more likely to finish high school, go on to earn a two- and four-year degree, no matter what their background is. I met a year and a half ago with the leaders of the Business Roundtable. They were mad that I — they were angry. I said, well, they were d discussing <laughs> why I wanted to spend money on education. I pointed out to them, as Vice President, I met with over eight — I think it was 182 of those folks. Don't hold me the exact number. And uh, I asked them what they need most, the CEOs. And you've had the same experience on both sides, Dow. They say a better educated workforce, right? So I looked at them. And I say, I come from Delaware. DuPont used to be the eighth largest corporation in the world. And every new inter enterprise they bought, they educated the workforce to that enterprise. But none of you do that anymore. Why are you angry with me providing you the opportunity for the best educated workforce in the world? And they all looked at me and said, I think you're right. I want to expand high-quality tutoring and summer learning to see that every child learns to read by third grade. I'm also connecting local businesses and high schools so students get hands-on experience and a path to good-paying job whether or not they go to college. And I want to make sure the college is more affordable. Let's continue increasing the Pell Grants to working and middle-class families and increase record investments in HBCUs and minority-serving institutions, including Hispanic institutions. And I was told I couldn't universally just change the way in which we did, dealt, dealt with student loans. I fixed two student loan programs that already existed to reduce the burden of student debt for nearly 4 million Americans, including nurses, firefighters, <laughs> and others in public service. Like Keenan Jones, a public educator from Minnesota, who's here with us tonight. Keenan, where are you? Keenan, thank you. He's educated hundreds of students so they can go to college. Now he's able to help, after debt forgiveness, get his own daughter to college. <laughs> and, folks, look. Such relief is good for the economy because folks are now able to buy a home, start a business, start a family. While we're at it, I want the public school teachers a raise. And by the way, the first couple of years, we cut the deficit. <laughs> now, let me speak to the question of fundamental fairness for all Americans. I've been delivering real results in fiscally responsible ways. We've already cut the federal deficit. We've already cut the federal deficit over a trillion dollars. <laughs> I signed the bipartisan deal. 
to cut another trillion dollars in the next decade. It's my goal to cut the federal deficit another three trillion by making big corporations very wealthy finally beginning to pay their fair share. Look, I'm a capitalist. If you want to make or can make a million or millions of bucks, that's great. Just pay your fair share in taxes. A fair tax code is how we invest things to make this country great. Health care, education, defense, and so much more. But here's the deal. The last administration enacted a $2 trillion tax cut. Overwhelmingly benefit the top 1 percent, the very wealthy and the biggest corporation, and exploded the federal deficit. They added more to the national debt than any presidential term in American history. Check the numbers. Folks at home, does anybody really think the tax code is fair? No. Do you really think the wealthy and big corporations need another $2 trillion tax break? No. I sure don't. Yeah. I'm going to keep fighting like hell to make it fair. Under my plan, nobody earning less than $400,000 a year will pay an additional penny in federal taxes. Nobody, not one penny. And they haven't yet. In fact, the child tax credit I passed during the pandemic cut taxes for millions of working families and cut child poverty in half. Restore that child tax credit. No child should go hungry in this country. The way to make the tax code fair is to make big corporations and the very wealthy begin to pay their fair share. Remember in 2020, 55 of the biggest companies in America made $40 billion and paid zero in federal income tax. Zero. Not anymore. Thanks to the law I wrote and we signed, big companies have to pay a minimum of 15 percent. But that's still less than working people pay in federal taxes. It's time to raise corporate minimum tax to at least 21 percent. So every big corporation finally begins to pay their fair share. I also want to end tax breaks for big pharma, big oil, private checks, massive executive pay when it's only supposed to be a million, a million dollars that could be deducted. They can pay them 20 million if they want, but deduct a million. End it now. You know, there are 1,000 billionaires in America. You know what the average federal tax is for those billionaires? No. They're making great sacrifices, 8.2 percent. That's far less than the vast majority of Americans pay. No billionaire should pay a lower federal tax rate than a teacher, a sanitation worker, or a nurse. I propose a minimum tax for billionaires of 25 percent, just 25 percent. You know what that would raise? That would raise $500 billion over the next 10 years. And imagine what that could do for America. Imagine a future with affordable child care. Millions of families can get they need to go to work to help grow the economy. Imagine a future with paid leave, because no one should have to choose between working and taking care of their sick family member. Imagine, imagine a future of home care and elder care and people living with disabilities so they can stay in their homes and family caregivers can finally get the pay they deserve. Tonight, let's all agree once again to stand up for seniors. Many of my friends on the other side of aisle want to put Social Security on the chopping block. If anyone here tries to cut Social Security, Medicare, or raise the retirement age, I will stop you. The working people, the working people who built this country pay more into Social Security than millionaires and billionaires do. It's not fair. We have two ways to go. Republicans can cut Social Security and give more tax breaks to the wealthy. I will, that's the proposal. Oh, no. 
You guys don't want another $2 trillion tax cut? I kind of thought that's what your plan was. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. You're not going to cut another $2 trillion for the super wealth. That's good to hear. I'll protect and strengthen Social Security and make the wealthy pay their fair share. Look. Too many corporations raise prices to pad their profits, charging more and more for less and less. That's why we're cracking down on corporations engaged in price gouging and deceptive pricing, from food to health care to housing. In fact, the snack companies think you won't notice if they change the size of the bag and put a hell of a lot fewer <laughs> same, same size bag, put fewer chips in it. No, I'm not joking. It's called shrinkflation. Pass Bobby Casey's bill and stop this. I really mean it. You probably all saw that commercial on Snickers bars. You get, you get to charge the same amount, and you got about, I don't know, 10 percent fewer Snickers in it. <laughs> Look, I'm also getting rid of junk fees, those hidden fees at the end of your bill that are there without your knowledge. My administration announced we're cutting credit card late fees from $32 to $8. Banks and credit card companies are allowed to charge what it costs them to, in, to instigate the, re, the, the collection. And that's more a hell of a lot, like $8 and 30-some dollars. They don't like it. The credit card companies don't like it. But I'm saving American families $20 billion a year with all the junk fees I'm eliminating. <laughs> Folks at home, that's why the banks are so mad. It's $20 billion in profit. I'm not stopping there. My administration has proposed rules to make cable, travel, utilities, and online ticket sellers tell you the total price up front so there are no surprises. It matters. It matters. And so does this. In November, my team began serious negotiation with a bipartisan group of senators. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Oh, you don't think so? Oh, you don't like that bill, huh? That conservatives got together and said it was a good bill? I'll be darned. That's amazing. That bipartisan bill would hire 1,500 more security agents and officers, 100 more immigration judges to help tackle the backload of two million cases, 4,300 more asylum officers, and new policies so they can resolve cases in six months instead of six years now. What are you against? One hundred more high-tech drug detection machines to significantly increase the ability to screen and stop vehicles smuggling fentanyl into America. That's killing thousands of children. This bill would save lives and bring order to the border. It would also give me and any new president new emergency authority to temporarily shut down the border when the number of migrants at the border is overwhelming. The Border Patrol Union has endorsed this bill. The Federal Chamber of Commerce is — yeah, yeah. You're saying low. Look at the facts. I know — I know you know how to read. I believe that, given the opportunity for a majority in the House and Senate, would endorse the bill as well, a majority right now. But unfortunately, politics has derailed this bill so far. I'm told my predecessor called members of Congress in the Senate to demand they block the bill. He feels political win. He viewed it as a, would be a political win for me and a political loser for him. It's not about him. It's not about me. I'd be a winner, not really. I.
Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of thousands of people being killed by illegals? To her parents, I say, my heart goes out to you, having lost children myself. I understand. But look, if we change the dynamic at the border, people pay people, people pay these smugglers 8,000 bucks to get across the border because they know if they get by, if they get by and let into the country, it's six to eight years before they have a hearing. And it's worth the, taking the chance of the $8,000. But, but, if it's only six months, six weeks, the idea is it's highly unlikely that people will pay that money and come all that way, knowing that they'll be able to be kicked out quickly. Right. Folks, I would respectfully say, to suggest my, friend, my Republican friends owe it to the American people, get this bill done. We need to act now. And if my predecessor is watching, instead of paying politics and pressuring members of Congress to block the bill, join me in telling the Congress to pass it. We can do it together. But that's what he apparently hears what he will not do. I will not demonize immigrants saying they are poison in the blood of our country. I will not separate families. <laughs> <laughs> I will not ban people because of their faith. Unlike my predecessor on my first day in office, I introduced a comprehensive bill to fix our immigration system. Take a look at it, as all these and more. Secure the border. Provide a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. And so much more. But unlike my predecessor, I know who we are as Americans. And we're the only nation in the world with a heart and soul that draws from old and new. Home to Native Americans and ancestors have been here for thousands of years. Home to people of every place, from every place on Earth. They came freely. Some came in chains. Some came when famine struck, like my ancestral family in Ireland. Some to flee persecution, to chase dreams that are impossible anywhere but here in America. That's America. And we all come from somewhere. But we're all American. <laughs> <laughs> Look, folks, we have a simple choice. We can fight about fixing the border, or we can fix it. I'm ready to fix it. Send me the border bill now. A transformational moment in history happened 58, 59 years ago today in Selma, Alabama. Hundreds of foot soldiers for justice marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, named after the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, to claim their fundamental right to vote. They were beaten. They were bloody and left for dead. Our late friend and former colleague John Lewis was on that march. We miss him. Joining us tonight, our other marchers, both in the gallery and on the floor, including Betty Mae Fikes, known as the voice of Selma, the daughter of gospel singers and preachers. She sang songs of prayer and protest on that bloody Sunday to help shake the nation's conscience. Five months later, the Voting Rights Act passed and was signed into law. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But 59 years later, their force is taking us back in time. Voter suppression, election subversion, unlimited dark money, 
Extreme gerrymandering. John Lewis was a great friend to many of us here. But if you truly want to honor him and all the heroes of March with him, then it's time to do more than talk. Pass the Freedom to Vote Act, the John Lewis Voting Right Act. And stop, stop denying another core value of America, our diversity across American life. Banning books, it's wrong. Instead of erasing history, let's make history. I want to protect fundamental rights. Pass the Equality Act. And my message to transgender Americans, I have your back. Pass the PRO Act for workers' rights. Raise the federal minimum wage, because every worker has a right to a decent living more than eight, seven bucks an hour. We're also making history by confronting the climate crisis, not denying it. I don't think any of you think there's no longer a climate crisis. At least I hope you don't. <laughs> I'm taking the most significant action ever on climate in the history of the world. I'm cutting our carbon emissions in half by 2030, creating tens of thousands of clean energy jobs like the IBW work is building and installing 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations. Conserving 30 percent of America's lands and waters by 2030. I'm taking action on environmental justice fence line communities smothered by the legacy of pollution. In pattern after the Peace Corps and America Corps, I launched the Climate Corps to put 20,000 young people to work in the forefront of our clean energy future. I'll triple that number in a decade. To state the obvious, all Americans deserve the freedom to be safe. And America is safer today than when I took office. The year before I took office, murder rates went up 30 percent. 30 percent they went up. The biggest increase in history. It was then, through, no, through my American Rescue Plan, which every American voted against, I'm mad at. We made the largest investment in public safety ever. Last year, the murder rate saw the sharpest decrease in history. Violent crime fell to one of its lowest levels in more than 50 years. But we have more to do. We have to help cities invest in more community police officers, more mental health workers, more community violence intervention. Give communities the tool to crack down on gun crime, retail crime, and carjacking. Keep building trust, as I've been doing, by taking executive action on police reform and calling for it to be the law of the land, directing my cabinet to review the federal classification of marijuana and expunging thousands of convictions for the mere possession, because no one should be jailed for simply using or having it on their record. Take on crimes of domestic violence. I'm ramping up the Federal Enforcement of the Violence Against Women Act that I proudly wrote when I was a senator so we can finally, finally end the scourge against women in America. There are other kinds of violence I want to stop. With us tonight is Jasmine, whose nine-year-old sister Jackie was murdered with 21 classmates and teachers in elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. Very soon after that happened, Jill and I went to Uvalde for a couple of days. We spent hours and hours with each of the families. We heard their message. So everyone in this room, in this chamber, could hear the same message. The constant refrain, and I was there for hours meeting with every family. They said, do something. Do something. Well, I did do something by establishing the first ever Office of Gun Violence Prevention in the White House that the Vice President is leading the charge. Thank you for doing it. Mm. Meanwhile, mm. 
Meanwhile, my predecessor told the NRA he's proud he did nothing on guns when he was president. After another shooting in Iowa recently, he said, when asked what to do about it, he said, just get over it. There is his quote, just get over it. I say, stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. <clears throat> I'm proud we beat the NRA when I signed the most significant gun safety law in nearly 30 years because of this Congress. We now must beat the NRA again. I'm demanding a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. Pass universal background checks. None of this. None of this. I taught the Second Amendment for 12 years. None of this violates the Second Amendment or vilifies responsible gun owners. You know, as we manage challenges at home, we're also managing crises abroad, including in the Middle East. I know the last five months have been gut-wrenching for so many people, for the Israeli people, for the Palestinian people, and so many here in America. This crisis began on October 7th with a massacre by a terrorist group called Hamas, as you all know. 1,200 innocent people, women and girls, men and boys, slaughtered after enduring sexual violence. The deadliest day of the, for the Jewish people since the Holocaust. And 250 hostages taken. Here in this chamber tonight are families whose loved ones are still being held by Hamas. I pledge to all the families that we will not rest until we bring every one of your loved ones home. We also... <clears throat> We will also work around the clock to bring home Evan and Paul, Americans being unjustly detained by the Russians and others around the world. Israel has the right to go after Hamas. Hamas ended this conflict by releasing hostages, laying down arms, could end it, by, by releasing the hostages, laying down arms, and sur surrendering those responsible for October 7th. But Israel has a... <coughs> Excuse me, Israel has an added burden because Hamas hides and operates among the civilian population like cowards, under hospitals, daycare centers, and all the like. Israel also has a fundamental responsibility, though, to protect innocent civilians in Gaza. <clears throat> this war. has taken a greater toll on innocent civilians than all previous wars in Gaza combined. More than 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, most of whom are not Hamas. Thousands and thousands of innocents, women and children, girls and boys, also orphaned. Nearly 2 million more Palestinians under bombardment or displacement. Homes destroyed, neighbors in rubble, cities in ruin. Families out food, water, medicine. It's heartbreaking. I've been working nonstop to establish an immediate ceasefire that would last for six weeks to get all the prisoners released, all the hostages released, to get the hostages home and ease the intolerable and humanitarian crisis and build toward an enduring, a more something more enduring. The United States has been leading international efforts to get more humanitarian assistance to Gaza. Tonight, I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza that can receive large shipments carrying food, water, medicine, and temporary shelters. No U.S. boots will be on the ground. A temporary pier will enable a massive increase in the amount of humanitarian assistance getting into Gaza every day. <clears throat> and Israel must do its part. Israel must allow more aid into Gaza to ensure humanitarian workers aren't caught in the crossfire. And they're announcing they're going to they're going to call, have a crossing in northern Gaza. To the leadership of Israel, I say this: 
Humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Protecting and saving innocent lives has to be a priority. As we look to the future, the only real solution to the situation is a two-state solution over time. <laughs> and I say this as a lifelong supporter of Israel. My entire career, no one has a stronger record with Israel than I do. I challenge any of you here. I'm the only American president to visit Israel in wartime. But there is no other path that guarantees Israel's security and democracy. There is no other path that guarantees that Palestinians can live in peace with, with peace and dignity. And there's no other path that guarantees peace between Israel and all of its neighbors, including Saudi Arabia, with whom I'm talking. Creating stability in the Middle East also means containing the threat posed by Iran. That's why I built a coalition of more than a dozen countries to defend international shipping and freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. I've ordered strikes to degrade the Houthi capability and defend U.S. forces in the region. As Commander-in-Chief, I will not hesitate to direct further measures to protect our people and our military personnel. <clears throat> For years, I've heard many of my Republican and Democratic friends say that China is on the rise and America is falling behind. They've got it backwards. I've been saying it for over four years, even when I wasn't president. America's rising. We have the best economy in the world. And since I've come to office, our GTP is up, our trade deficit with China is down to the lowest point in over a decade. And we're standing up against China's unfair economic practices. We're standing up for peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. I revitalized our partnership and alliance in the Pacific. India, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Pacific Islands. I've made sure that the most advanced American technologies can't be used in China, not allowing to trade them there. Frankly, for all this tough talk on China, it never occurred to my predecessor to do any of that. I want competition with China, not conflict. And we're in a stronger position to win the conflict of the 21st century against China than anyone else, for that matter, than any time as well. Here at home, I've signed over 400 bipartisan bills. There's more to pass my unity agenda. Strengthen penalties on fentanyl trafficking. You don't want to do that, huh? <laughs> pass bipartisan privacy legislation to protect our children online. Harness. Harness the promise of AI to protect us from peril. Ban AI voice impersonations and more. And keep our truly sacred obligation to train and equip those we send into harm's way and care for them and their families when they come home and when they don't. <laughs> That's why the song support and help of Dennis and the VA, I signed the PACT Act, one of the most significant laws ever, helping millions of veterans expose the toxins who now are battling more than 100 different cancers. Many of them don't come home, but we owe them and their families support. We owe it to ourselves to keep supporting our new health research agency called ARPA-H. And remind us, remind us that we can do big things like end cancer as we know it, and we will. Let me close with this. I know you don't want to hear any more, Lindsay, but I got to say a few more things. <laughs> I know it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> when you get to be my age, certain things become clearer than ever. I know the American story. 
Again and again, I've seen the contest between competing forces in the battle for the soul of our nation, between those who want to pull America back to the past and those who want to move America into the future. My lifetime has taught me to embrace freedom and democracy, a future based on core values that have defined America, honesty, decency, dignity, equality, to respect everyone, to give everyone a fair shot, to give hate no safe harbor. Now, other people my age see it differently. <laughs> the American story of resentment, revenge, and retribution, that's not me. I was born in mid-World War II when America stood for the freedom of the world. I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, in Claymont, Delaware, among working-class people who built this country. I watched in horror as two of my heroes, like many of you did, Dr. King and Bobby Cunningham, were assassinated. And their legacies inspired me to pr pr pursue a, care, a career in service. I left the law firm and became a public defender because my city of Wilmington was the only city in America occupied by the National Guard after Dr. King was assassinated because of the riots. And I became a county councilman almost by accident. I got elected to the United States Senate when I had no intention of running at age 29. Then vice president, our first black president. Now president to the first women vice president. In my career, I've been told I was too young. <laughs> By the way, they didn't let me on the Senate elevators for votes sometimes. Not a joke. <laughs> and I've been told I'm too old. <laughs> Whether young or old, I've always been known, I've always known what endures. I've known our North Star. The very idea of America is that we're all created equal and deserves to be treated equally throughout our lives. We've never fully lived up to that idea, but we've never walked away from it either. And I won't walk away from it now. I'm optimistic. I really am. I'm optimistic, Nancy. My fellow Americans, the issue facing our nation isn't how old we are. It's how old are our ideas. Hate, anger, revenge, retribution are the oldest of ideas. But you can't lead America with ancient ideas that only take us back. If you lead America, the land of possibilities, you need a vision for the future and what can and should be done. Tonight, you've heard mine. I see a future where defending democracy, you don't diminish it. I see a future where we restore the right to choose and protect our freedoms, not take them away. I see a future where the middle class has finally has a fair shot and the wealthy have to pay their fair share in taxes. I see a future where we save the planet from the climate crisis and our country from gun violence. Above all, I see a future for all Americans. I see a country for all Americans. And I will always be president for all Americans, because I believe in America. I believe in you, the American people. You're the reason we've never been more optimistic about our future than I am now. So let's build the future together. Let's remember who we are. We are the United States of America. And there is nothing, nothing beyond our capacity when we act together. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you.
President Biden concluding his State of the Union address came in at about an hour and seven minutes, a little bit shorter than last year. Uh, now shaking hands and greeting uh, some members of the assembled dignitaries. He'll probably spend some time going back up the aisle the same way he came in, with lots of people looking for a moment with the president, a selfie, a hug, a handshake. Joining me, I've got uh, some great political analysts. Josh Robin is with me here in studio. Taylor Popolars is on Capitol Hill. Tim Boyum is uh, also in Washington. Alex Cohen in California. Karina Kling in Texas. Jason Fechner up in Wisconsin. Thank you all so much for uh, joining me. And let's uh, go around and get some uh, quick impressions. Let's start with you, Tim. Uh, my headline, if I was writing a headline for tomorrow, tired of playing defense, Biden goes on offense. And I'll go into this a little later as we get into this, but I was watching two close things. Um, President Trump, how much did he sort of come up? Taylor Popolars deserves credit for counting this. He said, my predecessor 13 times. Also, his age issue. He went right at it at the end. You heard that there. He said, I know I may not look like it, but I've been around for a while. When you get to my cer age, certain things become clearer than ever before. I, th I think the administration is tired of playing defense for a while, and tonight they definitely went on offense. Okay. Alex Cohen, what were your impressions? <laughs> I think context is key. Uh, folks might remember it wasn't that long ago we saw that emergency press conference where he was talking about his age and memory and things went very bad for him in that context. In this room with so much love and support and even um, some contrast, right? We saw those moments where he was getting blowback from the Republicans, from Marjorie Taylor Greene. In that context, I think this is fighting Joe Biden a much stronger, even almost feeding off of some of those criticisms. A very different performance tonight, and I think we'll see some uh, bumps up in approval ratings in the days to follow. Okay, let's go to uh, uh, Karina Kling. What were your impressions? Yeah, I think the president came across as very hopeful and optimistic, but also just using what he was saying there to show that he is not going to back down. I was taking a uh, special interest in his comments on the border, an issue that is front and center here in Texas and really across the rest of the country, as we've been discussing, and just laying out what was in that bipartisan border security bill, even with the heckling, even with all of the Republicans pushing back and continuing to say, pass this, join me, my predecessor, in helping pass this. And we also saw from uh, Senator Langford of Oklahoma, one of the Republicans who helped push this bipartisan border bill, continuing to, uh, or saying, while we saw him mouth, it's true when Biden was laying out what's in the border bill and how it would have uh, helped along the border as he saw it. Indeed. Um, up in Wisconsin, we have Jason Fechner. Tell us what you saw uh, tonight in this speech. <laughs> Carol, some fascinating moments there, and Alex touched on that. He delivered a strong speech when he was focused on the teleprompter, of course, but those moments where he went off script, for the most part, were some of his stronger moments there, showing that he's ready for a political fight, of course. Speaker Mike Johnson had implored his fellow Republicans ahead of the State of the Union address to pull back on any of that back and forth with the president and try to uh, refrain from any outbursts there on the House floor. But as you could see, President Biden seemed to really go on the attack when a lot of those moments took place throughout the night there on Thursday. It'll be very interesting to hear the Republican response upcoming here to see what they have to say in response to what the president had to say tonight and obviously the spin, which will continue for hours on end now. Indeed, for our viewers at home, uh, Spectrum News will bring you uh, the Republican response to the president's State of the Union address when it begins. That should be any moment now, and we'll cut right to it. Uh, Josh Robin, I was struck by the fact that the president went right into foreign policy right off the bat, something you don't normally hear uh, from a president in the State of the Union. He talked about Ukraine and Russia, and he brought it home to quickly to January 6th and the threats to democracy here. Just following up on what everyone else is noticing, there's a problem when Republicans kind of set the bar so low that essentially calling President Biden catatonic and demented is that when he comes out and delivers a very fiery speech, now we're talking about it might have been too fiery. So was it overcompensation? Was it too political? Or was it just the kind of vigor that this moment demands? I think, obviously, his aides 
feel that it is fitting for this political time that we live in. And speaking of politics, it was the most political, if you can say that, State of the Union speech I've heard. Um, but it's a political chamber. I mean, all of these people there are politicians. It's also reflective of our time. Not too long ago, there was a Republican convention that was held at the White House, actually. Um, one final note, I think this moment, broadly we're going to be talking a lot for days, I think, about Biden resetting, Biden exceeding expectations, Biden has the vigor, Biden uh, leaning into it. One thought, one uh, line that I thought was really interesting was when he w w held up a button of a young woman named Lakin Riley, 22 years old, who was killed by an undocumented immigrant, an illegal immigrant in Georgia. He apparently had been handed the button by someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene, and he didn't shy away from it. I don't know if he was prepped ahead of time, but he also called the person who killed, allegedly killed Riley, an illegal. And that might have been him speaking out as he normally speaks. It wasn't considered necessarily politically correct. I just think people are going to be talking about that. I don't know if it's going to turn off the kind of middle voter that Biden is looking to, to bring into his fold. Indeed. Um, the president, as I've mentioned before, uh, in uh, a sea of Democratic supporters and admirers, Adam Schiff was there just a minute ago shaking hands with him. He's a prominent candidate who just won or finished in the top two uh, in a Democratic uh, primary or a, an all-party primary uh, out in California. Uh, a number of others who are, are all running for election or re-election, trying to get a moment with uh, the president. And uh, Taylor Popolars, uh, what's the scene like there? The, the speech is over, the, cha the chamber is emptying. Are people, uh, what, running to the cameras, uh, talking to the folks back home? <laughs> There's definitely some of that. We're over on the Senate side of the Capitol complex, so we, it's a little bit quieter here just because there's fewer senators, 100, compared to the 435 House members. But there's obviously the crop of lawmakers who are the ones who will officially respond, besides Alabama Senator Katie Britt, who will continue to either go after President Biden or commend him for his remarks in the days to come. The, the Biden camp campaign and the Biden White House has a lot of allies on Capitol Hill, and on the Republican side, there are a lot of deep and sharp critics. As we're about to hear from Senator Katie Britt from Alabama, some excerpts of her speech, the, the Republican response, were released. I believe we have a graphic we could put up, one excerpt, where she talks about Biden and his age. She says, right now, our commander-in-chief is not in command. The free world deserves better than a dithering and diminished leader. America deserves leaders who recognize that secure borders, stable prices, safe streets, and a strong defense are the cornerstones of a great nation. So I think it's interesting there. We talked before Biden spoke about how Britt is the, the youngest ever Republican woman elected to the Senate. She's just 42 years old, contrasting with Biden, who is the oldest ever president at 81. It's clear she's going to lean further into that. But I, I, I think it's, it'll be interesting to hear how the lawmakers respond to not only how political this speech was, but also how Biden tried this balancing act of maybe appeasing to more moderate and independent voters, where he talked about immigration. And he talked about Lake and Riley and used the term illegal, which Democrats have not used for years, while he also brought up the Israel and Hamas war and talked about a two-state solution for Israel and Palestine and talked about the need for a six-week ceasefire while all these protesters have been gathered around the streets here in downtown Washington. So I think it's just a very interesting moment and kind of a, you know, a capture of the, the political balancing act while trying to continue pursuing his legislative agenda that he tried to map out in this speech. Uh, you know, Alex Cohen, there have been uh, uh, moments, and we uh, already uh, talked about some of them tonight, when the president seemed to be gleefully uh, engaged in combat with some of his adversaries, with some of the hecklers that were in the chamber. Uh, one extraordinary moment, though, that he himself kind of teed up uh, was when he invited uh, the crowd to join him in chastising the Supreme Court as the justices, including the chief justice, sat right there. That was really something I've never seen before. Gonna get you to the Indy 500. 
I, I think this is where Joe Biden kind of gets his mojo. There was a really interesting profile recently in The New Yorker talking about how you know, Joe Biden has been kind of laid back for a while. And a lot of people have been expressing concerns that this will not be enough to win him the election come fall. But timing here may be everything. And we're seeing a real shift here into him needling his opponents, you know, talking about the immigration bill and asking Donald Trump and yet not referring to him by name to join him. Uh, the president seems to get the message that when he needles his adversaries, uh, he did not use it tonight, but we've been hearing him refer to Donald Trump as a loser a lot lately. He knows that that gets under people's skin. And I almost feel like that is a, a monster energy drink boost for the president. When he has those moments, it seems to get him much more engaged in this game because it's showing a certain virility, for lack of a better word, that I think a lot of people have been looking for. I think, as, as some of the folks have said here tonight, the real question will be, did he go too far? And certainly using, for example, certain words to describe immigrants who have come here without documentation, that could put him at serious risk with folks like the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, Senator Alex Padilla, who has warned the president, don't do the same things that Donald Trump has done. I have a feeling we'll be hearing a lot of blowback around that uh, with the Latino vote that we know he needs to court. Um, and and uh, Tim, you were at the White House earlier today. You um, got the full court press from the White House press corps, uh, the, the president's, I should say, press team, uh, trying to tell the press corps uh, what the themes would be. Did they give you uh, some advance notice that it was going to be this kind of a combative speech from the president? No, not at all. I got the sense that they felt very confident about where the, the nation is right now and what they're doing and that they were going to put forward, you know, where they think they are, where they think they're in a great place. They think the economy is in a great place um, and they were going to go forward with what they want to do moving forward, you know, with the, the tax increases, uh, the corporate tax increases, whatnot. But I don't think there was any sense that there was going to be sort of a combative moment, you know, a moment where you know, I think there's going to be a lot of Democrats that are going to say, look, great, this is, uh, you know, the energetic, passionate man that's ready for a fight, which a lot of Democrats do want. But you're going to have a lot of Republicans saying, look, this was an old, angry man yelling at a teleprompter. I think the big question is, you know, we're sitting here talking about what politicians think. I think the big question is, where's middle America on this that was watching this at home, if they were watching this at home tonight? I'd be really interested to see what the polling is in the days ahead with middle America and these independent voters that probably don't look at it the same way that we do. Uh, because it's going to be important, you know, as we've said a lot of times, perception is sometimes just as important, if not more important, than reality when it comes to politics. Uh, and I think they're trying to fight that. But to answer your initial question, no, I didn't get any kind of indication that it was going to be uh, quite like it was tonight. Okay. You know, and Josh, uh, I mean, to the extent that we were um, looking for signs of whether or not um, the president's age would be an issue, Never mind what he said at the end when he himself brought it up. What did you make of the actual delivery throughout the speech? Energetic, <laughs> fiery, feisty. Um, I, I, there was only a small glass of water there. I was, I, I mean, I couldn't get through that without drinking more water. Mm -hmm. um, he, I, I think that this was the reset that they're looking for. I'm just taking in what my colleagues are saying and wondering how this plays. Is this a man who very much has his faculties or the old man screaming at the screen, uh, screaming uh, at, from the podium. I, I think it's more of the former. And look, you have someone who he's running against who uh, you know, has his own problems with speeches and delivery. And I, I think that the president is was trying to convince Americans that he very much has what it takes, that he's fully with it, he's fully cognizant, and then some. Again, just getting back to my initial comment, it's just a problem when the criticism of Biden has been that he's essentially feeble, that if he delivers a speech like this, that just throws the bar on the floor. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm, I guess I'm just wondering if, if people lament that they had called him so demented. Curious to know your thoughts, actually, on yeah. that. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, look, look I think it, it, it is striking to, to the, just the excerpt that we heard that we're going to, I guess, hear delivered um, in real time from uh, the Republican response. 
sort of saying the commander in chief is feeble and so forth. And I understand the line was written before anybody came to the chamber tonight. Um, but that's not what I saw. I did not see a feeble commander in chief. I saw somebody who uh, is a smooth and practiced uh, politician who was doing what a, an experienced politician will do. He, he was making his points and, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of needling the other side a little bit here and there, saying, hey, uh, you know, I, I know you know how to read. Uh, let's let, let's talk about some of the numbers of my my great performance, that kind of a thing. He, he also looked like he was having a good time. Obviously, in parts, he's talking about very important issues. But look at him now. I mean, this is someone who has been in Washington, D.C. since the early 1970s. He loves this stuff. He yes. didn't get out and become a, a, a lobbyist. He he just likes the glad handling of it, and he's really in his element now. He definitely, you know, there was one, <clears throat> there was four, uh, one year ago, I think there was one famous line where he talked about Social Security, and it was impromptu, it was ad-libbed. Here, there were a whole bunch. He clearly was coached that Marjorie Taylor Greene and others are going to be yelling at you, and he he very much was ad-libbing lines on it. Maybe it was slightly too much, but one of them in particular, um, when he was uh, talking about Social Security, this actually might have been scripted, but um, any cuts to Social Security, I will stop you. That's going to be in, they're going to they're gonna boost that out in, in memes. If, if I may, or one, one other impromptu thing was his interaction before. This is going to get a lot of play with Marjorie Taylor Greene. So Marjorie Taylor Greene, the kind of um, very a uh, fiery Trump supporting congresswoman from northern Georgia. She is wearing a MAGA hat actually and hands him that button about uh, Lake and Riley. And when um, Biden saw her coming down the aisle, it's, it's a very funny look in his face. He clearly wasn't expecting someone violating House rules, by the way, but wearing a MAGA hat on the floor of the House of Representatives. Yeah, I was going to say, that's something I've never seen before. Uh, you know, when we, we keep wandering into this. Um, maybe unwanted new territory where uh, it's, I guess, now commonplace. I guess we've seen it now for going on a decade now that people will shout out things as if it was uh, the, the British House of Parliament, you know, where uh, folks yelling things from the crowd, um, and now uh, wearing campaign buttons or campaign regalia uh, during the State of the Union speech. Um, one, one wonders where it's all going to head, uh, uh, ultimately. Um, Jason Fechner, let me ask you this. Uh, when the, the president um, went right into uh, the issue of abortion, of uh, a woman's right to choose, when he took on the Supreme Court as the justices sat there, what does that say to you about where this campaign is likely to go starting tomorrow? Fascinating. Fascinating moment there, and obviously they've seen the polling, they've seen the numbers, and they've gone through the last couple election cycles as well. They know what a critical issue is for them going forward and for much of the country, including many women across the country. So no surprise that they hit a lot of those points and they hit them relatively early there. That moment with the Supreme Court, that's a moment for history, as you mentioned, kind of unparalleled, unprecedented to, to see that camera shot too. And also really worth watching throughout much of the night there, Speaker Mike Johnson watching his reactions behind the president and next to the vice president, Kamala Harris there, seeing kind of what he keyed in on, what he didn't, how he reacted to those moments, especially when talking about IVF and talk about Roe versus Wade and talk about the Dobbs decision and kind of seeing the dance we talk often about politics and so much of politics being optics that was fascinating to watch too throughout the course of the speech there and one final quick note when we were talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, Democratic Wisconsin Congresswoman Gwen Moore attempted to kind of pick and roll and, and insert herself there and let the president that might be the very first pick and roll in the history of the State of the Union and I don't know how successful it ended up being. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff going on down there on the floor. I've noticed that even even now, as the the president chats with some of uh, the mostly Democratic uh, supporters who want to get a word with him or get a selfie, get a picture with him, um, uh, many of them are candidates for office. Many of them are seeking election or re-election. Um, some of them are trying to do a little government business, maybe uh, talk uh, talk about a. Um, uh, a program that they might want. Uh, for our Spectrum News viewers, we're uh, bringing you the uh, aftermath at this point of the uh, State of the Union speech delivered by President Biden. The Republican response is due to begin. However, uh, by tradition and in 
Indeed, I think they're going to follow this tradition tonight. The Republican response will not begin until the president has left the floor. Uh, to the extent that these folks want a word with him, they want a selfie, they want to chat, and we can see that clearly the president loves it. This is a pretty friendly crowd, and he's been doing politics for literally upwards of 50 years of his life. Uh, I think we can expect this to, to take a few minutes. Uh, to, oh, here we go. And my son, Ridgeway, are why I ran for the Senate. I'm worried about their future and the future of children in every corner of our nation. And that's why I invited you into our home tonight. Like so many families across America, my husband Wesley and I just watched President Biden's State of the Union address from our living room. And uh, what we saw was the performance of a permanent politician who has actually been in office for longer than I've been alive. One thing was quite clear, though. President Biden just doesn't get it. He's out of touch. Under his administration, families are worse off, our communities are less safe, and our country is less secure. I just wish he understood what real families are facing around kitchen tables just like this one. You know, this is where our family has tough conversations. It's where we make hard decisions. It's where we share the good, the bad, and the ugly of our days. It's where we laugh together. And it's where we hold each other's hands and pray for God's guidance. And many nights, to be honest, it's where Wesley and I worry. I know we're not alone. And so tonight, the American family needs to have a tough conversation. Because the truth is, we're all worried about the future of our nation. The country we know and love seems to be slipping away, and it feels like the next generation will have fewer opportunities and less freedoms than we did. I worry my own children may not even get a shot at living their American dreams. My American dream allowed me, the daughter of two small business owners from rural enterprise Alabama, to be elected to the United States Senate at the age of 40. Growing up, sweeping the floor at my dad's hardware store and cleaning the bathroom at my mom's dance studio, I never could have imagined what my story would entail. To think about what the American dream can do across just one generation, in just one lifetime, it's truly breathtaking. But right now, the American dream has turned into a nightmare for so many families. The true unvarnished state of our union begins and ends with this. Our families are hurting. Our country can do better. And you don't have to look any further than the crisis at our southern border to see it. President Biden inherited the most secure border of all time. But minutes after taking office, he suspended all deportations, he halted construction of the border wall, and he announced a plan to give amnesty to millions. We know that President Biden didn't just create this border crisis, he invited it with 94 executive actions in his first 100 days. When I took office, I took a different approach. I traveled to the Del Rio sector of Texas. That's where I spoke to a woman who shared her story with me. She had been sex trafficked by the cartels starting at the age of 12. She told me not just that she was raped every day, but how many times a day she was raped. The cartels put her on a mattress in a shoebox of a room, and they sent men through that door over and over again for hours and hours on end. We wouldn't be okay with this happening in a third world country. 
This is the United States of America, and it is past time, in my opinion, that we start acting like it. President Biden's border policies are a disgrace. This crisis is despicable. And the truth is, it is almost entirely preventable. From fentanyl poisonings to horrific murders, there are empty chairs tonight at kitchen tables just like this one because of President Biden's senseless border policies. Just think about Lake and Riley. In my neighboring state of Georgia, this beautiful 22-year-old nursing student went out on a jog one morning, but she never got the opportunity to return home. She was brutally murdered by one of the millions of illegal border crossers President Biden chose to release into our homeland. <laughs> Y'all, as a mom, I can't quit thinking about this. I mean, this could have been my daughter. This could have been yours. And tonight, President Biden finally said her name. But he refused to take responsibility for his own actions. Mr. President, enough is enough. Innocent Americans are dying, and you only have yourself to blame. Fulfill your oath of office, reverse your policies, end this crisis, and stop the suffering. Sadly, we know that President Biden's failures don't stop there. His reckless spending dug our economy into a hole and sent the cost of living through the roof. We have the worst inflation in 40 years and the highest credit card debt in our nation's history. Let that sink in. Hardworking families are struggling to make ends meet today and with soaring mortgage rates and sky high childcare costs. They're also struggling to how to plan for tomorrow. The American people are scraping by while President Biden proudly proclaims that Bidenomics is working. Goodness, y'all, bless his heart, we know better. I'll never forget stopping at a gas station in Chilton County one evening. The gentleman working the counter told me that after retiring, he had to pick up a job in his 70s so that he didn't have to choose between going hungry or going without his medication. He said, I, I did everything right. I did everything I was told to do. I worked hard. I saved. I was responsible. He's not alone. I hear similar concerns from fellow parents, whether I am walking with my friends or whether I'm at my kids' games. But let's be honest, it's been a minute since Joe Biden pumped gas, uh, ran a carpool, or even pushed a grocery cart. Meanwhile, the rest of us see our dollar and we know it doesn't go as far. We see it every day. And despite what he tells you, our communities, are not safer. For years, the left has coddled criminals and defunded the police, all while letting repeat offenders walk free. The result is tragic, but foreseeable. From our small towns to America's most iconic city streets, life is getting more and more dangerous. And unfortunately, President Biden's weakness isn't just hurting families here at home. He is making us a punchline on the world stage. Look, where I'm from, your word is your bond. But for three years, the president has demonstrated that America's word doesn't mean what it used to. From 
abandoning our allies in his disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan to desperately pushing another dangerous deal with Iran. President Biden has failed. We've become a nation in retreat. And the enemies of freedom, they see an opportunity. Putin's brutal aggression in Europe has put our allies on the brink. Iran's terrorist proxies have slaughtered Israeli Jews and American citizens. They've targeted commercial shipping, and they've attacked our troops nearly 200 times since October, killing three U.S. soldiers and two Navy SEALs. Meanwhile, the Chinese Communist Party is undercutting America's workers. China is buying up our farmland, spying on our military installations, and spreading propaganda through the likes of TikTok. You see, the CCP knows that if it conquers the minds of our next generation, it conquers America. And what does President Biden do? Well, he bans TikTok for government employees, but creates an account for his own campaign. Y'all, you can't make this stuff up. Look, we all recall when presidents faced national security threats with strength and resolve. That seems like ancient history. Right now, our commander in chief is not in command. The free world deserves better than a dithering and diminished leader. America deserves leaders who recognize that secure borders, stable prices, safe streets, and a strong defense are actually the cornerstones of a great nation. Just ask yourself, are you better off now than you were three years ago? There's no doubt we're at a crossroads and it doesn't have to be this way. We all feel it. But here's the good news. We, the people, are still in the driver's seat. We get to decide whether our future will grow brighter or whether we'll settle for an America in decline. Well, I know which choice our children deserve. And I know the choice the Republican Party is fighting for. We are the party of hardworking parents and families. And we want to give you and your children the opportunities to thrive. And we want families to grow. It's why we strongly support continued nationwide access to in vitro fertilization. We want to help loving moms and dads bring precious life into this world. Wesley and I believe there is no greater blessing in life than our children. And that's why tonight I want to make a direct appeal to the parents out there and in particular to my fellow moms many of whom I know will be up tossing and turning at 2 a.m., wondering how you're going to be in three places at once and then somehow still get dinner on the table. First of all, we see you, we hear you, and we stand with you. I know you're frustrated. I know you're probably disgusted by most of what you see going on in Washington, and I'll be really honest with you, you're not wrong for feeling that way. Look, I get it. The task in front of us isn't an easy one, but I can promise you one thing. It is worth it. So I am asking you for the sake of your kids and your grandkids, get into the arena. 
every generation has been called to do hard things. American greatness rests in the fact that we always answer that call. It's who we are. Never forget, we are steeped in the blood of patriots who overthrew the most powerful empire in the world. We walk in the footsteps of pioneers who tamed the wild. We now carry forward the same flame of freedom as the liberators of an oppressed Europe. We continue to draw courage from those who bent the moral arc of the universe. And when we gaze upon the heavens, never forget that our DNA contains the same ingenuity that put man on the moon. America has been tested before, and every single time we've emerged unbowed and unbroken. Our history has been written with the grit of men and women who got knocked down. But we know their stories because they did not stay down. We are here because they stood back up. So now it's our turn, our moment to stand up and prove ourselves worthy of protecting the American dream. Together, we can reawaken the heroic spirit of a great nation. Because America, we don't just have a rendezvous with destiny. We take destiny's hand and we lead it. Our future starts around kitchen tables just like this, with moms and dads just like you. And you are why I believe with every fiber of my being that despite the current state of our union, our best days are still ahead. May God bless you and may God continue to bless these United States of America. Senator Katie Britt, who uh, gave the Republican response to the State of the Union address, um, back with my panel. Let me go right to you, Karina Kling. What did you make of, of uh, what do you make of that re response from uh, Senator Britt? Yeah, I mean, I will just continue to reemphasize how much the border was front and center in her speech. But also just the fact that the contrast, and this has been pointed out, but the age difference from seeing President Biden to seeing this senator, very young, very energetic, never broke from the camera. Uh, it, it's an interesting take, I think, sometimes to see the GOP response when the Democrats are in office or vice versa, because it is directly into the camera, whereas uh, the president giving the address to Congress is not addressing directly the American people. And it, it's interesting to see, and it'll be interesting to kind of see the reaction to how effective what she was saying is, but obviously a big contrast from what we heard from President Biden and continuing to hit on issues that she just says has been a, have been a failure under his leadership, the border being one of them, talked a lot about inflation uh, being at record levels. And uh, also I was uh, noted, just was trying to see when and if she might get to the issue of IV IVF and really hit on that a lot at the end there too. So interesting to see kind of how her speech will be uh, just taken in from the, the, the people and the response to it. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, and uh, Taylor Popolars, how was Senator Britt seen in Washington? She notably did not mention any particular legislation that she either wants to support or has sponsored herself. 
Yeah, the, the senator is a freshman member. She's only been here for a couple of years, but before that, she actually served as a Senate chief of staff to uh, her predecessor, Richard Shelby, the longtime senator from Alabama. She's very well respected by both sides of the aisle. There are many Democrats who, before she came out to give this address, they said that they they thought the, the response made sense, that she was selected and that she was considered a future of the party, and that they also got along well with her. I think it'll be interesting to hear kind of what people thought in the aftermath, even just being on, on social media. I saw people responding, finding her tone either a bit dark or a bit, uh, someone even said like an ASPCA commercial, but Republicans really felt that she kind of leveled straight with them, with their supporters and calling out President Biden for what they view as flaws. Even her opening line, I think, stood out. She called this president's State of the Union speech a performance of a permanent politician who has actually been in office longer than I've been alive. So as Karina was mentioning, that contrast with age there. And as she drilled into the topic about the border, I think what was most fascinating, one of the most interesting exchanges in President Biden's State of the Union speech was on the border and the border bill that was negotiated on a bipartisan basis here in Congress, but then shot down when former President Donald Trump said that he didn't want it to go forward. So it was interesting how Senator Britt brought that up, but didn't really lean into the specifics of how the leader of her party is the reason it in many ways just stopped. Very interesting. And um, Alex Cohen, I mean, the, when uh, Senator Britt said uh, that she considers uh, President Biden to be dithering and diminished, uh, whatever you might think about him, that's not what we saw in the hour right before that response, right? No, it's not. And we're also seeing that. I think we should talk for a moment about social media right now. Uh, the dark Brandon campaign on the uh, platform formerly known as Twitter has said, you know, I am at Panera Lemonade. They're making fun, almost having that self-deprecating humor about just how fiery of a speech it was from President Biden. But I, I think what we saw here from Brit and what we've seen time and time again is language being used very definitively to try to paint an image. And all the messages that I've seen coming through from uh, Donald Trump's team tonight has been honing in on what they've been saying all along. He's too old. He's too weak. He is not the right choice. Uh, and, and one of the things that Brit said, I think maybe even more than diminished, I think maybe her most potent point point this evening is, are you doing better now than you were a couple of years ago? I think that's actually where the Republicans might be able to do a little bit more damage, because regardless of what the economic numbers out there look like, people who are going out to get lunch and paying, you know, $20 for a sandwich at a chain are thinking, when did this happen? Even if I'm making more today than I did four years ago, I'm not feeling as if I'm doing well enough. And I think she might have scored some real points there. Okay. Uh, Tim Boyum, what did, what did you think of Senator Britt's uh, response? You know, Errol, this has been a fascinating night in American politics. I mean, we came in from North Carolina last night, and you could just sort of sense the high-stakes nature of tonight, and we saw that play out uh, on both of the addresses tonight. I thought it was interesting that it was done in her kitchen, you know, and some might say that's a great strategy. Uh, you know, the kitchen table issues, as I brought up earlier, you know, the grocery prices that people are still having so much troubles with and sort of might be relatable to the American public. But then Alyssa Fair Griffin, who worked in the Trump administration, tweeted out, I don't know who needs to hear it, but women are allowed to be places other than the kitchen. Uh, so I thought that was an interesting response, too. So uh, much like everything tonight, I think it's going to depend on where you sit with the, these individuals and these two sides about how it's perceived. But um, it, it's a memorable night. No question about that. Absolutely. And Jason Fechner, uh, what would you make of the response? Did it address uh, some of what the president was talking about? There were definitely some rewrites ahead of it, for sure. The economy in the eye of the beholder, Senator Britt there saying that it's the worst inflation in 40 years. President Biden earlier saying that our economy here is the envy of the global industrialized world right now because we seem to have global inflation under better control than many other countries do. Roughly 10 percent of the country watched the State of the Union. Fewer than that obviously watched the Republican response. And as Tim had mentioned there, a lot of Americans get up tomorrow. Gas prices still relatively high. Grocery prices still relatively high. The potential impact, at least on the economic side of the things, of this speech will definitely be diminished as the weeks go on. Okay. And, and Josh, we were trying to uh, figure out, you know, are you better off than you were three years ago? Well, the inflation was lower, but it was on its way really up. Um, three years ago, also, Roe v. Wade was the law of the land. It depends where you look. Um, I think she's going to be, she's very compelling for a number of people. She's also getting 
really hammered and made fun of, which is unfortunate, but it's the way things go. Um, I, I just don't know if it, the, the dithering and diminished leader, as you, as you were talking about earlier, that didn't seem to fit with the, the really amped up Biden that we saw tonight. Okay, Josh, Robin, that'll be the last word. Taylor Popolars, Tim Boyum, Alex Cohen, Karina Kling, and Jason Fechner, thank you all for your time and your insight. Uh, we're going to be talking again, of course, in the future, and we thank you at home for watching. I'm Errol Lewis. More news coming up next on Spectrum. Stay with us.